Hello and welcome to the Walled Culture Podcast, where we take a look behind the copyright bricks that are blocking access to knowledge and innovation. I'm Carlin Lillington, and our Walled Culture guest today is Fred von Lohmann, a, co a copyright lawyer who's been a prominent voice internationally on digital copyright and IP issues, both in court and out. If you've followed the subject of digital copyright in the news or professionally over the years, you've almost certainly read or heard or seen Fred. Most recently, he served as legal director at Google, and that was for nearly a decade. And before that, he was a senior staff attorney with EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation in California, where he specialized in intellectual property matters and brought forward some groundbreaking copyright legal cases. Prior to those roles, he was a visiting researcher with the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology and was an associate with the international law firm of Morrison and Forster. He's appeared many times in the media and with his gift for making copyrights complexities accessible to the general public, we're delighted to have him here for today's Wald Culture podcast. Welcome, Fred. Thank you very much. I'm interested in what drove your interest and professional focus on the whole area of copyright and IP in the first place. So uh, I like to uh, call this my conversion moment. Um, I remember quite vividly when this issue really uh, became something that I thought might be worth really devoting my career to. Uh, this was back in 1994. I was a law student at Stanford at the time. And John Perry Barlow, who some may know as a songwriter for the Grateful Dead and others may know as uh, one of the co-founders of EFF, um, wrote an article in Wired magazine called The Economy of Ideas. And uh, you can still get it and read it for free online. I encourage anyone who's interested in this topic to go back and read uh, Barlow's article. It's amazingly prescient. Again, he wrote this in 1994, uh, now almost 30 years ago. And in it, he discusses the ways in which copyright and the internet were on a collision course. Uh, I really think he was one of the very first people to understand that, to see it coming. Uh, and he basically said, every all of the fights we've had about free speech in the past those fights would be on the internet. And the lens through which those battles would be fought would be the lens of copyright. Uh, because of course, and you know, I'm sure we'll talk more about this, uh, in the digital age, almost every piece of expression you can imagine is subject to copyright law. Uh, and that's of course not as true in the pre-digital world, although more than some people may think, right? Of course, a lot of what was on radio, television and print was also shaped by copyright law. Uh, but in the digital realm, now literally everyone and everything, every comment you post on Facebook, every video you post to TikTok, every email you compose, all of that is, you know, copyright applies to it and copyright law shapes uh, how you can distribute that stuff, where you can post it, when it'll be taken down. Um, so, you know, I read that article in 1994, and I remember it was it was so profound a moment for me. I remember to this day where I was when I read it. I was in the the student I was in the student lounge at Stanford, and when I put that magazine down, uh, I said to myself, "Wow, this I'd love to work on this issue." And uh, so, yeah, that's that's how it all began for me is an article in Wired by John Perry Barlow. Wow. I, and, and was your, the fact that you were at Stanford and right in the heart of Silicon Valley, I mean, Palo Alto, where Stanford is, is often termed uh, ground zero for Silicon Valley. And so many innovators have come out of there as well, in, including your, um, your, your most recent, recent employer, um, Google, or big corporate employer, um, with very strong ties to Stanford, of course. Um, was that an influence in your interest? I mean, was that already interesting you as you went as you studied as an undergrad? Because you, you did both undergrad and then you stayed on and took your law degree there as well. So you were pretty immersed. Was that a, was that a link too? 
You know, I think it's fair to say yes. The fact that I spent seven years at Stanford, although I I did spend three years between my undergraduate and my law school uh, time there in Washington, D.C., which also uh, was, I think, influential in what I ended up going on to do. Um, But definitely, I'm not sure I would have recognized it as much at the time, uh, because after spending so many years here, you take things for granted that a lot of other people maybe don't. Uh, So for example, I was using email in 1986, um, which to me didn't seem so unusual, but very few people uh, were using email and the internet. I mean, it wasn't even called the internet back then. Uh, I was still using what was then called ARPANET, which was the Department of Defense's sort of precursor of the internet. And Stanford had access to that network because it was one of the research universities that sort of pioneered uh, that the use of that network. Um, but it is true, I think being so close to Silicon Valley made a difference. Um, you mentioned Google. Of course, Google didn't exist yet. Uh, Google was founded in 1998. Um, so... Uh, But interestingly, EFF did exist, and EFF was founded in 1990. uh, And so in some ways, a lot of the early thinking about the internet was happening in the San Francisco Bay Area earlier than in other places. Wired Magazine, for example, was based in San Francisco. uh, And I think that did make a difference. I did absorb that. I, I was using the internet in... Must have been, you know, 93, 92, 93, I was using FTP and Gopher and Waze, all these technologies that are now basically forgotten. And, and it was and, actually and a painful Stanford by short... comparison. <laughs> I was going to say in painful by yes, comparison yes. with what we use now. But sorry, go ahead. That's no, that's absolutely right. And that, that is sort of my next uh, story about Stanford is that was where I saw the World Wide Web for the first time. Um, And that was another experience that was so profound for me that I remember vividly exactly where I was and where I was sitting uh, the first time I opened a web browser, which back then was the Mosaic browser, which was the precursor of what would become Netscape. Um, And I remember seeing that browser and using it and thinking to myself, nothing will ever be the same again. Uh, the, the level of ease of use that the browser brought to the internet, uh, sort of overnight making all the older tools obsolete, uh, it was sort of obvious, at least it was to me and I think many others at the time, um, that this was going to be a big deal. This was no longer just going to be a few uh, you know, university nerds tapping away about physics papers. Um, you know, this was going to become a mainstream uh, technology that would change everything, which of course it did. Um, And so that, I do think there was, it did make a difference. I remember actually in law school, there was a small startup company called Ricochet that made the first sort of commercially available wireless modem. So I remember this was pre-Wi-Fi, there was no Wi-Fi back then. And so I remember in, it must have been about 1995, Uh, being in the law school, sitting in class, uh, reading the New York Times while I was supposed to be listening to lectures on my laptop because I had a wireless modem. And, you know, that at the time didn't seem seem so strange, but most of the world did not have wireless internet uh, on their laptops for 10 years or more after that. So I think there was being in the San Francisco Bay Area sort of meant that you experienced a lot of the internet about five years before everybody else did. And and when you, what brought you to EFF then as um, that was a really important role um, during the time that you were there, you were, you, you were involved in, um, in many 
key cases and arguing many of the key arguments that still reverberate across the internet now and problems that still exist and haven't been resolved, highlighted by you back then. Um, what brought you there when? And I'm curious why you went to this kind of advocacy and activist role rather than maybe into the big corporate um, position on behalf of the, uh, the content industry. Um, given your background and um, very good law degree at that point? Well, uh, you know, EFF for me was a dream job. Um, I really fell in love with EFF roughly the same time as I fell in love with the internet generally, uh, right? 1994, 1995. Uh, and again, Wired Magazine had a huge amount to do with that because Wired was one of the first publications that really... Uh, you know, talked about EFF, talked about the cases that EFF were, was involved in. Um, and at the time, you know, it was the only civil liberties organization that really cared about the Internet. Um, you know, in the early days when I was at EFF in the early 2000s, we used to joke and call ourselves the ACLU for the Internet. Um, that the, the American Civil Liberties Union, for those who are not uh, familiar with that organization. Um, and of course, that's the sort of largest, oldest free speech and civil liberties organization in the United States. Uh, and, you know, now you can't really say that because, of course, the ACLU is across all kinds of important civil liberties issues on the Internet. But that wasn't true in 2001. You know, in 2001, the ACLU, I, I don't think most people at the ACLU had ever used the Internet um, or if they had, they were not uh, as deeply involved uh, as EFF and, uh, you know, some other organizations at the time. Uh, and so, you know, I read about EFF. Uh, I, you know, followed their cases. In fact, when I was at the law school, I helped organize the very first uh, cyber law, as we called it back then, the first class that Stanford Law School ever taught about the Internet and the law. Um, uh, I was a research, you know, assistant for uh, Professor Peggy Radin, who was the professor who taught that class. And, you know, I read all kinds of stuff that about EFF and the cases that EFF uh, had brought. So I knew a lot about EFF, but I never thought that I would be lucky enough to get to work there. It was sort of one of those dream jobs. And so uh, after I... Uh, graduated from law school, I did work at a large law firm, as most law school grads from Stanford do. Um, but then I uh, actually went and took a research fellowship at UC Berkeley across the bay. Uh, and I was thinking of becoming a law professor. And I hopefully were talk, think about the internet and the law and write about it. Uh, and while I was uh, pursuing that research, it, EFF had a job opening. And uh, as I like to joke, in 2001, before the dot-com bubble burst, there were not that many corporate lawyers who were willing to take a 65% pay cut to go work for a nonprofit. Um, now, six months later, the streets were full of unemployed lawyers who would have taken that job. But I feel very lucky that I was there six months earlier before the bust uh, and uh, was lucky enough to get that job. And uh, I was at EFF for about nine years after that. And uh, it was, from a copyright point of view, the a unique time, right? When I look back at the first decade of the 21st century, uh, so much about the shape of the internet was, at least in terms of legal disputes, sort of hammered out in those 10 years. Like so many big cases, the Napster case, uh, was sort of opening that decade, you know, and then all these cases involving uh, you know, internet services that, you know, 10 years earlier hadn't even existed. Uh, so as a copyright lawyer, it was really, I think, again, I was very lucky to be there at the right time when copyright law was being remade in the courts uh, and to some extent even in Congress um, during those years to try to shape the internet, try to take account of the internet. Uh, can you, can one you thing I think, some... sorry, go through. Uh, yeah, I guess well, I, I was wondering some of your, some of your, what you would have seen as some of the pivotal moments during your time there, um, 
maybe you could touch on some of those because that's it's really such a fascinating time. Sure, sure. Um, you know, at EFF, we had all kinds of cases, large and small. Um, on the large end, I think uh, certainly the case that I think was uh, the, the biggest case in copyright that EFF took was the MGM versus Grokster case, uh, which was a case that went all the way to the United States Supreme Court in 2005. Uh, and some people, Grokster is, I think, mostly forgotten these days, uh, but uh, it actually involved two different companies that made the Grokster software and the Morpheus software, uh, which were peer-to-peer -peer file sharing applications that ran on your desktop. This was, you know, this was before the days of ubiquitous cell phones that were powerful enough to do this sort of thing. So back then, this was a desktop computing uh, kind of technology. Uh, and it was basically similar to Napster and LimeWire and all of the other peer-to-peer -peer file sharing applications that were so popular in the first five years of the 21st century. Uh, and uh, of course, the, the entertainment industry sued those technologies. Uh, and there were a lot of interesting copyright questions there to be resolved. Uh, because while it's definitely the case that lots of people were using that software to copy music and later on movies without permission, uh, you know, the technology had a lot of uses, not just for piracy. Uh, and in that sense, they, it was similar to the Betamax VCR, uh, which was also met with a very famous lawsuit in the United States uh, that you know, ended up the court, Supreme Court ended up saying, hey, we understand this technology can be and is being used for piracy. But as long it is, as it is capable of substantial non-infringing uses, it's all right to sell it. Uh, now, you can't help people commit piracy. You can't aid and abet them. But it's not, a, you know, it's not unlawful to sell a technology for copying things. Um, and it is really that foundational case involving the Betamax VCR that makes it okay for us to have hard drives and, you know, CD burners and, you know, photocopiers and, uh, you know, all the technologies that we take for granted today that depend on copying things. Uh, so the Grokster case was about asking, well, does that doctrine survive in the modern digital age? Is it still okay to make a piece of software uh, that is capable of copying things. And, uh, you know, in the end, in 2005, the Supreme Court sort of punted on the question uh, and said, well, we don't need to decide that. But what we will say is that it is not okay to induce infringement, uh, a new doctrine that the Supreme Court sort of made up for the, uh, to try to uh, sort of cut this Gordian knot. And they said, you can't encourage people, you can't uh, basically give people instructions for, hey, here's how you can use software to commit copyright infringement. Um, now, you know, it was a disappointing ruling for our clients. Uh, they, of course, lost the case because the court ultimately found that they had induced infringement through their advertising and instructions and other behavior. Uh, but in a lot of ways, I think it was you know, if not a win, at least it prevented a much worse outcome. Uh, the court did not go as far as the entertainment industries had wanted. They did not say that it's illegal to make a piece of technology just because users can misuse it. Um, and of course, to this day, we still have software like BitTorrent. Um, and of course, lots of now your, your cell phone, I mean, every cell phone today has the ability to essentially do what we used to call peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, where you can send a file directly from your phone to another phone. Uh, there doesn't need to be a central server in the middle. Uh, you know, people can use their devices as servers, essentially. Now that's a standard feature. Uh, but back in 2001, that was somewhat revolutionary. And of course, Napster sort of kicked it all off back in 1999. Um, bringing this idea uh, to the fore. Um, so that was the big case. We had lots of small cases at EFF. Uh, one of my favorites involved an animator who did a famous uh, sort of presidential 
a campaign satire to the tune of This Land is Your Land. And uh, the, a music publisher showed up. I mean, this was in the heat of the presidential race. It was obviously a political, uh, it was a satire on both sides. It was sort of making fun of the Republican and the Democratic candidate uh, kind of equally. Uh, but it was a music publisher that showed up and tried to shut that down, claiming that they owned uh, the the underlying lyrics, basically, to This Land is Your Land, written by the famous Woody Guthrie. Um, and uh, we, of course, at EFF were happy to take that case, uh, believing that this was clearly covered by fair use, the American copyright doctrine that allows certain kinds of uses. And uh, we were surprised to discover, once we did all our research, uh, there were a couple of interns that were working at Public Knowledge in Washington, D.C., who actually went to the archives, the Woody Guthrie archives at the Smithsonian, uh, and discovered that the Woody Guthrie had basically put this stuff in, these lyrics to This Land is Your Land, into the public domain many, many years before. Uh, so in the end, we sort of won that. The publisher, once they saw our research, sort of backed down and surrendered. Uh, but I was disappointed. Sometimes it's not enough just to win. I was like, wow, we, I would have loved to get a ruling on fair use, but I'll, I'll take the win uh, that I can get. And uh, so the good news for my part is I, uh, the, you know, I, we told the world that this land is your land, a real foundational song in American culture, uh, is free for everyone to use. It's in the public domain. That's very, just yet another reason to love Woody Guthrie, is it? And it's somebody who is thinking far ahead of his time in all sorts of ways. Um, do you, a, a follow on question, just going back to Grokster, I wonder if the decision had been sort of resoundingly um, built on the Sony decision, that Betamax decision that said, well, if if technology can be used in um, in all these other ways, then it, it's not really it shouldn't be the, the, the it's not on the shoulders of the of the companies that users might sometimes use it in these different ways. I wonder how do you if it had gone the other way towards a really strong result in your fa in, in your favor for what you were arguing for? Um, what directions do you think copyright might have gone? since because it just seems such an important case at such an important time with so many knock-on effects which maybe we'll come back to some other aspects of this as well but what if you'd what if you'd gotten everything you wanted out of that case where might we have ended up well that's an interesting question um i guess i'd take this from a couple of different angles um first i think there was a real loss uh, in terms of the future of the internet, in terms of innovation, uh, when all of these lawsuits, not just the Grokster case, but the Napster lawsuit and all of the lawsuits against peer-to-peer -peer file sharing services, there was litigation. I mean, some people may remember there was lawsuits brought against Scour, Audio Galaxy, you know, LimeWire, like all these applications. It, it For a while there, it was sort of like, a loss, it seemed like there was being a loss, uh, there was a new lawsuit every couple months. Um, what that did is it really did cast a pall over that form of technology, peer to peer technology generally. Um, I remember in the, like the year 2000, you know, Napster had just gone from zero to one of the most famous pieces of software in the world in the course of basically less than six months. Um, and lots of technologists recognize the potential of this sort of infrastructure that to stop relying on centralized servers. And instead, what could we do if we just thought of the internet as every, uh, uh, an interconnected web of everyone's individual computers? You know, instead, instead of relying on giant data centers, uh, in the center, what if we just put all the intelligence, all the content, all the computing power, why if, what if we just relied on everyone's individual computers to handle all of that? Um, and the lawsuits, I really do think, ended, sort of killed off the investment in that area. 
And there was a lot of excitement. A lot of people don't remember because it's sort of overshadowed by this music piracy Napster story. But companies like IBM, Hewlett Packard, big companies fought the future of the internet might look peer to peer, might look mm. decentralized. Uh, mm. And I remember all the that lawsuits as a journalist. chased all the. Sorry, yeah. as a journalist, and I remember I really this, do... and it was Intel. All these companies were focusing on peer to peer. It was, the, and it was from a journalist point of view, looking onto it. It was that you could see well, where, how, how are you going to square this circle of on the one side the content companies fighting this, and on the other side you have. Um, a real big corporate interest in this, as well as an end user interest. So such an interesting area that, um, yeah. as you say, kind of sputtered out. <laughs> yeah, I think people were scared off. I mean, peer to peer as a technology approach is not really a just about, uh, uh, you know, piracy or file trading, right? That just happened to be the early application. In a lot of ways, this reminds me of blockchain today, where the sort of common thinking about blockchain is just all about cryptocurrency. It's all about Bitcoin and Ethereum and, you know, board ape uh, NFTs. Uh, without, you have to understand the underlying technology has a lot more interesting potential applications. And I do feel like, we missed an opportunity because of all these lawsuits in the 2000s, 2005 era. And, you know, imagine what the Internet would be like today if we if it really were decentralized. Um, it's funny seeing everyone who's upset today about the uh, uh, the dominance, if you will, of companies like Facebook and Google and Apple and Amazon. You know, these are uh, a lot of that has to do with the centralized infrastructure of the Internet. We all rely on their centralized servers for everything, whether it's our email or, you know, TikTok or YouTube or, you know, Instagram. Uh, all of it is built in a centralized fashion that depends on their centralized data centers. And you look at a company like Amazon. Today, Amazon is basically built on selling data center capacity to centralized capacity to companies all over the world. Um, imagine how different things would be if we had gone instead with a decentralized architecture where there wasn't any centralized power in the middle, where much more of the power resided with individual computer owners. And I think this dream is one that a lot of people are now starting to really think hard about. Well, of course, it's 20 years later now. Uh, we could have had, I think, a very different kind of internet infrastructure if it weren't for those lawsuits. So that's an example of what I think of sort of an unexpected knock-on effect, that it's not about the legal doctrine. It wasn't even really about whether the entertainment companies won or lost. The mere fact that they brought so many lawsuits against any company with the letters P2P, you know, in their uh, in their technology descriptions, uh, really changed the course of kind of our technology arc. I think. Um, I also think, you know, to your original question, what if it had gone the other way, or what if we had won wholeheartedly? Um, I, I, it's a, I don't, you know, I think. From the entertainment industry's point of view, nothing would be different. You know, I, I, peer to peer technology never went away. You know, the Grokster case was in 2005. And of course, for all the years since then, the entertainment industries have continued to complain about peer to peer file sharing, you know, with BitTorrent, with mega upload, with, I mean, you know, the technology never went away. The, the piracy never went away. Uh, so, the, I don't think the law significantly changed the equation. What really changed the equation for the entertainment industries was their grudging, reluctant entry into the market. They finally gave the fans what the fans wanted. You know, what I always say to people is there would be no iTunes store without Napster, right? I mean, the, the, the music industry would never have let go of control. They would never have transitioned to digital if they hadn't been forced at the point of a Napster, if you will, um, to really engage. 
Uh, and now, of course, you look at services like Spotify and, you know, the Apple Music and all of the online streaming music services. Today, they account for a majority of all the revenues of the major record labels. And those revenues are going up and up and up every year. So it, it wasn't the lawsuits that saved the entertainment business. It was their uh, f reluctant grudging meeting the fan where the fan was waiting, right? I mean, Napster showed us what was possible. And at that point, every music, every music fan said, I want all the music anytime. I, that's what I want. I don't want to go to the store and buy music 20 tracks at a time on a shiny plastic disc. That is not what I want. Um, and the entertainment industry finally, you know, the music industry first and then later the, the motion picture industry as well, sort of finally met the consumer, met the fan, uh, where the fan has, had, has been since 1999. Uh, so that part, the, the, the legal campaign, I don't think really changed the, uh, that's not what accounted, that didn't save the entertainment industry. Um, so, and ironically, the, on the technology side, um, this is a little bit changing the subject from the Grokster case, uh, but the other piece of copyright law that is sort of like the invisible, you know, I'm sort of rem reminded of the matrix, right? It's like the sort of invisible code that runs behind our reality um, is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which was passed in the U.S. in 1998 and gave us uh, an important part of that uh, law, gave us the whole notice and takedown system that has kind of been our reality uh, for the over 20 years now. The idea is that platforms like YouTube or Facebook or TikTok are not responsible for copyright infringement that users might get up to so long as they take things down when they're notified and they also have to terminate accounts of repeat infringers. So that whole structure, that whole idea that a centralized platform will be protected from the lawsuits, all the lawsuits that came after the peer-to-peer -peer people, if you ran a centralized platform, the law, the DMCA, gave you this special protection. I mean, it literally is called a safe harbor. So you can sort of imagine, let's say you have a fleet of technology ships, where are you going to put them? Are you going to put them out in the open sea where the hurricanes of lawsuits are destroying them? Or are you going to put them in the safe harbor, right? And that, when you think about it, you realize that it's not an accident that we have these centralized internet ecosystem that we live with today. It is di a direct result of the copyright law choices that were made, you know, in the late 90s. Uh, and it is a little bit like, I always forget whether it's the red pill or the blue pill in the matrix that shows you the truth behind it all. Um, but copyright law has a little bit of that character, at least when you look at the internet. Once you've taken the copyright pill, you suddenly recognize why our internet is structured the way it is at a technical level and at a legal level, right? I mean, every, every YouTuber who's ever had a copyright strike applied against them, there's a reason for that. And the reason for that goes back to this law that was passed in 1998. Uh, so that's, uh, that's another sort of very crucial piece of digital copyright law that shapes our world. Mm, mm. And the, there's there's so much there that I have. I'm sitting here digging through my questions because we we we've touched on so many different areas there. Um, I I one thing maybe maybe we might touch on a couple of specific areas of sort of the headline areas of copyright of digital copyright. Um, you've you've mentioned a few there. I also could you just touch on DRM digital rights management as well, where these kind of things that came in um, pushed by the platforms and the big companies. Um, you've argued DRM isn't about preserving content, it's about preserving platforms, which is a really nice way of thinking about it. Can you just explain um, briefly what DRM is and expand on why you say it has this particular effect? 
Yeah, sure. So it's funny you should mention that because the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA, uh, we've already said a little bit about the safe harbors that protected uh, online platforms from copyright liability. Uh, but the other sort of big piece of the DMCA was a, a new set of laws that made it illegal to circumvent, to bypass copy restrictions, copy protection technologies. So DRM, digital rights management. Uh, and uh, that was new, right? Before uh, the DMCA, for example, if you got a piece of software, back then it was probably on a floppy disk for people who remember that far back, um, there were some copy protection systems that were designed to try to stop you from copying software or whatnot, but there was no legal protection. If you could figure out how to hack your way around those restrictions, then there was no separate law that said that was illegal. Now, you still might be liable for copyright infringement if you then make an unlawful copy. Uh, but for example, let's say you just wanted to make a backup of software that you own. It wasn't illegal to bypass the copy protection in order to do that. The DMCA changed that by saying, no, now it is illegal to bypass DRM, to bypass these copy restrictions. Um, and many people believed that this was the content industries being stupid. You know, you, you got a lot of this in the early 2000s where the, the sort of uh, techies out there would say, oh, those silly Hollywood people, they are so naive. They don't understand that we will always be able to break their copy protection schemes and the law is not going to change that. Neener, neener, neener. How silly of them. Um, I, I, that sort of misunderstands what this law is for. The copyright industries never really believed that DRM would work in the sense of stopping people from committing piracy. They were always, I think, well aware that there would be plenty of leaky spots where people would figure out how to take the content out of the lockbox. Um, but what the, D, what the DMCA and the legal protection of DRM accomplished was it allowed them to assert control over technology, right? Because the DVD player is a great early example. Um, the DVD is scrambled. The data on a DVD is encrypted. It's scrambled and you need a key to unlock it. Um, and the key is inside every DVD player you buy, there is a chip or the, a, the code has been licensed and the keys are on there. So, but in order to get that license, in order to get that key, you need to basically get Hollywood's approval. You know, Hollywood basically got to set the rules for an entire technology of video playback, right? This is just for in your house to play. This is not even as a pre-internet technology. So there was no... This wasn't about distributing. This was just a disc to play in your own house. And Hollywood basically said, hey, if you, all these consumer electronics companies, if you guys want to make DVD players, you got to sign up to our license agreement in order to get our keys to decrypt those shiny plastic discs. And there's all kinds of terms in that license. And anybody who remembers DVDs will remember, for example, you couldn't skip the previews at the beginning of DVDs. They forced you to sit through it. DVDs were region coded. So if you bought a DVD in the US, you couldn't play it on a machine in Europe, right? These are not copyright things. There's nothing in copyright law that says you have to sit there and watch the previews. There's nothing in copyright law that says you're not allowed to take a, a disc you own and play it in another country. Um, but thanks to DRM, thanks to the legal protection of DRM, Hollywood and you know any content industry, software as well, now has the legal power, the authority to dictate to technology companies, you must build your machines the way we want you to build those machines. Otherwise, you don't get the keys. And if you try to get our content without the keys, well, that's illegal. Right. And so, uh, as you mentioned, DRM is not, you know, it was a, 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 a legal method by, w uh, by which the content industries could control their content way beyond what copyright law allowed them to do. It allowed them to control the technology 
that is used to play, the technology that's used to distribute their content in all kind of detail, much more detail than copyright law would have afforded. Um, and so, you know, we still see this, honestly. I mean, yes, DVD is sort of gone by the boards, uh, but we still see this, for example, with ebooks, right? I mean, famously, ebook publishers tried to prevent ebooks from being read aloud. Uh, because they had a separate audiobook market. And so they said, well, we don't want a computer to be able to read an ebook because that'll cut into our sales of the audiobook. Um, and these are the kinds of powers that copyright owners use DRM, uh, uh, you know, to this, that's how they get that power is by using DRM to say, hey, you want the keys, you have to go with our restrictions, we can put any restrictions we want. Uh, and so that's that's you know it's true in the software world. It's true uh, in the ebook world. Uh, you know, Blu-ray of uh, discs. Some people still use those. They're encrypted. Um, and uh, what's interesting to me, of course, is uh, in today's online world, more and more uh, control of the copy is becoming less and less relevant. Uh, so when you look at some you know, video games, for example, there's no way you can copy, you know, all of any of the major multiplayer online games, right? I mean, the, the value of those games is in being able to join that server and, you know, play with everyone else. Uh, and even there, though, we're seeing DRM now being used to control the gameplay experience. Right, so it's not about copyright. The software cannot be pirated. It cannot be copied um, and resold, right? Because it lives on a server. And, but nevertheless, through the, using the legal protection of DRM, game companies are saying we want to reach down into your own computer and control what how you play the game. Uh, you know, this is how they crack down on so-called cheat codes and other kinds of uh, uh, what they consider cheating. Uh, but the point is that, again, DRM allows content owners to control how their content is experienced. Uh, and that that's way beyond what copyright has ever allowed. I mean, copyright is just worried about copying and, you know, transmitting and, you know, distributing. Uh, it's not, it doesn't give the copyright owner by itself control over how you experience their content. In order to get that, they need to throw in a little DRM and then say, hey, if you wanna, if you want the keys, you gotta play by our rules. Right, the really interesting um, outline there of some of the um, unforeseen impacts or ways in which the things that were uh, uh, presented to us by the companies for one use are actually being used in a much broader way to continue to control um, our experience and to manage um, a, a market in a quite different way that's moved away from copyright. I want to come to two other things you've, you've, you've briefly touched on there. One of them is um, the automated filtering tool, tools and the way in which they're now being used to control um, Ostensibly, it's just a straightforward copyright issue on, say, a platform like YouTube. Many of us will, as you know, will know that experience of you might put a song to something and then suddenly you can't use that song with your whatever family video of your kids playing outside or whatever that where you thought the song would be nice. Um, but it, they, um, you've argued that this is so heavy handed that it now interferes with a fair use right, which um, Americans have for repurposing and for taking smaller amounts and then using for some other purpose. And also in, in the EU now we've acquired in, depending on the, how countries want to bring in our copyright, the, the EU copyright directive, fair use can be granted to citizens as well at, a, um, at varying levels. But can you talk a bit about what's going on there and, and why, why this is having the impact on fair use, which is such an important um, doctrine for individuals and for creators? Sure, so uh, this is sort of a, a continuing evolution of the issue that started with the DMCA safe harbors that we've already talked about. You know, in the pre-digital age, 
copyright law has always been what lawyers call a strict liability offense. That basically means if you made a copy, you broke the law, you're liable. We don't care what you intended. We don't care even whether you knew you made a copy, uh, you know, or if it wasn't authorized, right? A, a movie theater, for example, if a movie theater plays a movie and it turns out one of the songs that's in the, the credits at the end was not licensed, the movie theater is on the hook. Even though they didn't make the movie, they had no way of knowing whether that song was cleared or not cleared. Um, the same is true, television stations, radio stations, right? The, the, the traditional analog copyright law is very unforgiving. It's automatic, doesn't matter what you, know, what you knew. If you're a bookstore, you sold a book that happened to be unauthorized, you're liable. Doesn't matter whether you knew that book was authorized or not. Um, of course, that approach would make the internet essentially impossible because there is no way that a, a Google or a Facebook or a TikTok could possibly know whether every video, every message, every photograph was fully cleared or had something infringing in it. Um, if that were the rule, there just wouldn't be an internet, or at least there'd be not, there wouldn't be an internet that we all could participate in. It would look like television. There would be a few big creators who would just be sending us stuff uh, that their lawyers had cleared and vetted, right? It would not be, there would be no YouTube, there would be no TikTok, there would be no Instagram, there would be no Facebook, right? There wouldn't be, con there wouldn't be platforms that allowed individuals to create. Um, so the DMCA Safe Harbor has really made that possible by saying to platforms, any, you can take any content, you can host anything that users create, as long as you take stuff down when copyright owners tell you about it, and as long as you terminate repeat infringers, people who are like pirating all the time, they got to get kicked off. Um, so that was sort of the initial bargain that was sort of set in 1998 in the US, and then a few years later, similar bargains set up in European law. Now, I don't think anyone back then understood what an enormous success the internet was gonna be and how platforms like YouTube, platforms like uh, now TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, were gonna change everything. And so, Content owners got worried because lots of content was showing up on these platforms and they couldn't keep up with the taking it down. And so there began a long dance of negotiation between platforms and content owners. Uh, and YouTube sort of was the bellwether. YouTube launched a, a, a technology called Content ID, which was essentially automated filtering. It was a uh, every you know piece of music, television show, movie, there was a fingerprint taken out of that that allowed the YouTube in this case to identify that content if it ever showed up in someone else's upload, right? So that's why when you try to upload your video with that top 40 hit as the background soundtrack, YouTube is gonna know that that top 40 hit is in there. Uh, and the question then becomes, what do you do about it? And one of the most interesting things about Content ID is most content owners said, hey, we actually don't mind if the content is there as long as we get paid for it. And so today, the vast majority of matches with Content ID result in monetization. Basically, an ad will show up on your video and the money from that ad is going to go to the owner of that top 40 hit that you put in your video. Um, so at the big picture, at the big picture level, I actually think this is a win uh, in the sense for, for everyone. Um, fans are able to put whatever music they want in their videos. And most of the time, it's not going to get blocked because most of the time, a content owner is going to prefer a, a, a little bit of money if, through ads. Um, and all of this, you know, the, the, the creator, the individual user who's, you know, here's my skiing video, that person doesn't have to go try to find, well, who's the copyright owner of that top 40 hit that I put on my skiing video? Like, all of that is handled in the background, and the user doesn't have to know about it. So that part is good news. Good news for everybody. Great for YouTube, great for the content owner, great for the uploader, creator. Great. 
The problem with filters, though, is they're far from perfect. And it's also the case that content owners don't always play by the rules when they try to get paid for stuff. So you have a lot of examples that are well documented on YouTube and other platforms where uh, you have situations where the filter just makes a mistake, uh, blocks your content even though there's not any top 40 music in it, blocks your content, it misidentified something. Um, it also is a situation where content owners claim things that they don't actually own. So, you know, a famous example of this was a video of the Mars landing, uh, which of course is in the public domain because it, it's video made by the government, by NASA in this case, landing on Mars. Well, there were television stations, news broadcasters, who claimed that video because it was inside their news broadcast. And they just claimed the whole broadcast. So now suddenly everybody who wanted to upload this very important piece of public domain content was getting blocked because th this news broadcaster thought they claimed to own something they didn't own. Um, and so there's lots of these kinds of problems that filters present. Um, <clears throat> so if you're, and this is particularly relevant today because now in Europe, as you mentioned, as part of the new European copyright directive, um, there is now essentially a mandate for content filters for all large scale content platforms. So obviously that would include the YouTubes and TikToks and Facebooks and Instagrams of the world. Uh, but it might also include, you know, the Wikipedias of the world. It might also include the small startup that none of us have heard of yet. Um, and that becomes a real challenge because filters are hard. They're expensive to develop. Google has said that content ideas cost them more than $100 million already. Uh, and so how, how are we going to have a world where everybody needs to have filters where the filters don't always work correctly. Um, and, you know, who should bear that burden? Uh, I do sort of feel like Europe is on the cutting edge of this question. Uh, the, a lot of the big platforms already do some filtering, but Europe has gone so far as to say you kind of have to do it for all copyrighted works. So there are filters out there you can commercially license for mainstream music, um, there's probably going to be filters soon for things like television and video content. Uh, but we're nowhere near having a filter that can detect all copyrighted content. I mean, what about the poetry that someone recites in their TikTok video? What about the poster that is on the bedroom wall of the teenager who's doing a video for YouTube? You know, you know these are questions that, you know, the European... Uh, <clears throat> you know, when the European Parliament passed this, when this new directive went into force, I think they really didn't think it through. And I think we're going to see a lot of lawsuits in Europe in the next 10 years to try to hammer out how do you build filters that are fair to users um, and also don't constrict creativity too much. I mean, we don't, I, I get the big picture here is we don't want to go back to a world where everything is television, right? One of the greatest things about the internet was that it has unleashed so much new creativity. Uh, sites like YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you know, all these sites that we all know, plus, of course, hundreds of sites that we don't know. Right. I mean, I don't know what the popular sites are in Italy or in Indonesia. You know, I mean, there is far more creativity out there than any of us individually can appreciate. And that is all because those creators don't have to have lawyers. They don't have to have insurance policies before they can make something and find an audience. Because remember, thanks to copyright law, before before we had this internet thing in the pre-digital era, you needed a lawyer. You needed an insurance policy. You weren't going to get on television or in the movie theaters or, you know, on the radio with some homemade thing that no lawyer had ever looked at. Um, nobody was going to do that for you because... 
they would be afraid that there would be some copyright lawsuit brought against them if you if you plagiarized something or if you took a sample without clearing it or if you put a song in the end credits of your film you know these are the things that uh, uh in the pre-digital era made democratized creativity impossible today we have the tools we have the platforms and knock wood so far for the most part we've had a copyright law system that has encouraged and made possible this individual creativity and sort of remix culture where it's not just about you know making your own stuff but also engaging with the existing culture taking samples remixing commenting you know it's it's as natural as breathing to a person who's engaged with culture to want to reference that culture in their own creativity. And I don't think copyright law should stop most of that because most of that does not threaten the original copyright owner's market, right? I mean, nobody who samples, you know, uh, two seconds of music in their song is denying that original person a sale. In fact, if anything, they probably are encouraging a sale by someone who had otherwise not heard that. Um, and Similarly, of course, a lot of what we see on Twitch and, you know, in the video gaming context where people are basically making videos of themselves playing games, um, hugely successful new uh, media environment where lots of people are creating. I don't think that's hurting the video game companies. In fact, today, many of them are trying to encourage that kind of creativity. So how do we how, how how do we have a filter that can figure all of that out, right? I mean that's that's what's so scary about these upload filters. We don't have filters that are smart enough to know in advance whether that Twitch channel is going to upset the video game, the corporate video game creator who made the video game that that Twitch creator is now playing in. I've got about 500 more questions, but we're winding down towards the end of our hour here. I wanted to, I was hoping just to have you really briefly touch on software because I think there's this interesting, um, and this might have been something I imagine that arose during your time at Google, this issue of how software development is impacted by the use of copyright and uh, uh, on um, databases for machine learning, for example, and also software interfaces, which is really interesting. You've written about how this is, how the market gets controlled by large players by also controlling um, interfaces. Could you touch on that just really briefly? So interfaces and copyright protection for interfaces are an incredibly important question for the future of competition in, and innovation in the next 20 years, for sure. The Google versus Oracle case was the sort of headline maker in this area. Um, and rather than go through that case, which is complicated, let me let me put it in simple terms that I think everyone can understand. You know, Think about what an interface is. An interface is what allows you to interact with a piece of software. Uh, I think of it the way I would think of driving a car, right? The interface between you and the car is basically the steering wheel, the pedals, and if you're an old guy like me, the gear shift lever. Um, and that's how you interact with the car. You don't need to know what's under the hood. You don't need to know the intricate details of how the engine operates. You don't need to understand the transmission and the drivetrain and the differential and all the bits and pieces that make your car work. It doesn't matter to you. In fact, all of that can be changed, right? You can go from a, your Honda with an internal combustion engine to a Tesla with an electric drivetrain and the driving, the interface, the way in which you control the car is the same. That's the way it is for software as well. Um, now imagine in the car context, if someone owned that interface, if there was an, somebody who said, I own the steering wheel and pedals idea for controlling a car. Imagine how hard it would be for a competitor to come in and offer you a better car. That competitor, competitor would either have to get a license from the person who controls the car interface, or they would have to develop a completely new interface 
not steering wheel and pedals anymore. You'd have to learn how to drive, I don't know, with hand gestures or with a trackpad or who knows what, right? Imagine how difficult that would make the competitive environment. Imagine how much less innovation you would have in the auto industry if one company owned that interface. That's what we're facing now in the software world, where software companies are saying, we own, thanks to copyright, the interface for our software. The, con the way in which you control the user, often it's the programmer in that case, the, the commands, the libraries, the sort of ways in which the, a programmer can control a piece of software, uh, think, for example, about Amazon Web Services, right? So much of the internet runs on cloud services today. And if you've spent, you know, 100 hours optimizing your site to run on Amazon Web Services, what if you wanted to take your site and move to Google or move to IBM or move to Microsoft's cloud? Should you have to completely redesign your system for a totally new interface? Should it be unlawful for a competitor to say, hey, I can give you a better cloud? The same way, you know, a car company might say, I can give you a better car. But if you have to have a completely different interface, rewrite everything from scratch, you're not going to really be able to take advantage of that offer, you know? And that's what we're looking at now in the copyright interface context. Does copyright provide that kind of exclusive ownership over the interface, not the underlying code, right? Just like, again, the what in the car, what's under the hood, the transmission, all the stuff you don't directly control, that stuff, that can be owned by copyright. That's fine. That No one is arguing that that should not be owned. But the interface, the method by which you control the thing, the method by which you control the software, in the case of the software context, that, I think, it's going to be very important for competition and innovation that that remain free. Uh, in the end, Google did win that case against Oracle on a fair use theory, uh, but I think we need more robust protections there for innovators and competitors. Because if you're going to go in and compete against the Microsofts and Amazons and Apples of the world, it can't be the case that you have to come up with a completely new interface that millions of people have to learn from scratch before you can compete. That's crazy. <laughs> I think that's actually a really um, good point. Sorry. Sorry. Did you want to add something else to that or are you? No, no. Oh, okay. Sorry. It's a, um, no, I think that's a really good point maybe on which to end. I was going to ask you for some looking ahead where you saw some problems. I think you've ended pretty resounded, resoundingly on one that is there for, um, for software design. Um, and often those are, that's an area that often people aren't thinking about when they're thinking about copyright and content and they're thinking more about um, the end user experience perhaps and not so much um, other areas of impact like um, innovation and development and uh, uh, competition for new young companies that become tomorrow's uh, uh, success stories. But thank you so much for joining that's us always, on World that's... Culture here today. <laughs> Sorry, what do you want to say? Sure. Thank you. No, I was, I was going to say, I was going to just end with a quote from my uh, old friend, Cory Doctorow, who taught me uh, many years ago that the value of everything that hasn't been invented yet is always greater than the value of everything that's been invented so far. Uh, and that really, I think, has always made me remember, we really need to fight for the next Google the next Amazon, the next Microsoft, the next innovator that starts in a garage, that's the person who's not here to fight for themselves. Um, that's the person who all the giant companies today don't want to beat them out, don't want to see them rise up and do to them what they did to the dinosaurs of the past. You know, so... You know, I've always thought of myself as first fighting for the fan, but secondly, fighting for the innovator who's not here to fight for themselves. Um, and I think that's that's the best way to think about copyright. How does it how does it 
uh, impact the fan? How does it impact the next great innovator who none of us have heard of yet? Right. Okay. Well, that, that's a great wrapping up quote, I think, um, for everybody to think about and um, certainly pulls together so many strands of other discussions we've had with other people um, who have expertise in this whole area of copyright. Thank you so much for joining us. And to our listeners and our viewers, thank you for joining us. Um, for now, it's goodbye from me, Carla Millington, and the Wald Culture Podcast. We hope that you'll take some time to explore our many previous podcasts in which our guests take us inside these kinds of complicated places where technology and culture, innovation, and copyright collide. And they're all waiting for you at waldculture.org, um, along with regular blog posts on copyright issues, and of course, course, the free Wald Culture book, which brings together copyright insights from our many podcast interviews, and you can download that for free there. Thank you very much and goodbye. <music>